They called her the mysterious stranger and the Swedish Sphinx. Newspapers dubbed her the dream princess of eternity. More often, she was simply the divine garden. Although she made relatively few films compared with many of her contemporaries, she became one of the biggest stars of all time, one that has yet to dim. She was the one and only Greta Garbo. She was born Greta Louise Gustafsson on September 18, 1905, and grew up in dire poverty in Stockholm, Sweden. As a teenager, she worked as a sales girl in a large department store, where her natural beauty earned her a role in a promotional film for her employers. This led to other parts in commercials and in a slapstick comedy short. Greta won a scholarship to a prestigious dramatic school, where she met Moritz Stiller, one of Sweden's most acclaimed directors. Looking for an actress to play one of the leads in his epic film, The Atonement of Gustav Berle, Stiller cast Greta as the hero's romantic interest. The 17-year-old Greta played Countess Elizabeth Dona, a married woman who falls in love with a disgraced and defrocked minister. Her purity and love helped redeem her. It was Stiller who changed Greta's surname from Gustafsson to Garbo, although he had originally considered naming her Mona Gabor. Stiller and Garbo became inseparable, with Stiller carefully coaching and cultivating the young actress. His domination of her was total, but beneficial. While some murmured that Stiller and Garbo were like Svengali and Trilby, the results transformed Greta from a shy, awkward teenager into the actress who would become known as the Divine Garbo. The Atonement of Gosta Berling opened to mixed reviews in Sweden, but in Germany it was greeted with great critical acclaim. Similarly, while Garbo was virtually ignored in her native land, her performance garnered rave reviews in Berlin and helped win her a role in the German film The Joyless Street. Garbo starred along with the great cinema diva Asta Nielsen. This film told the tragic tale of women in Vienna after the First World War. Poverty-stricken in the post-war depression, many women were forced into prostitution to help support their families. Nielsen and Garbo played women who became caught in this web of prostitution. Garbo played Greta, a girl from a respectable family, eking out a living during the hard times. While waiting in line at a butcher shop, she passes out from hunger. When her father gets into deeper financial difficulty, Greta is coerced by a creditor into accepting invitations under questionable circumstances. At one such rendezvous, the respectable gentleman she meets for dinner turns out to be the butcher who gave favors to prostitutes while Greta fainted from hunger. 
Now he is willing to pay more attention to poor Greta. Next, Greta is summoned to attend a party thrown by the local madam for her clientele. There she sees the young lieutenant to whom she is attracted. Her disgrace is complete. The great German filmmaker G.W. Pabst, who directed the movie, wanted Garbo to appear in it. However, he could only obtain her services after Stiller insisted on script changes and a huge salary for the film, along with other demands. Caught between two feuding directors, the 19-year-old Garbo showed considerable anxiety early in the shooting. That changed after Pabst banned Stiller from the set and gave Greta continual encouragement. Ultimately, the subject matter proved too depressing and dreary, and the picture fared poorly in box offices around the world. When Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer approached Moritz Stiller with a deal for him to make movies in Hollywood, he was willing, but only on the condition that his protege Garbo was also signed to a contract. Opposed to accepting the virtually unknown foreign actress, head of MGM Louis B. Mayer eventually relented, though not without complaining, in America, men don't like fat women. But it soon became obvious that Greta Garbo was absolutely captivating before the cameras. With the release of her first American film, The Torrent, a new star rose in Hollywood. Marit Stiller did not share in her success. Unable to adapt to the American style of production, he feuded with studio executives and went back to Sweden in disgust. He died a year later. According to rumor, Stiller begged Garbo to return with him to Europe, and she regretted her refusal for the remainder of her life. In Hollywood, town of parties and showbiz openness, Garbo was a reclusive, elusive figure, avoiding the public glare and shunning publicity. This made her all the more attractive and mysterious, resulting in increased public fascination. Her studio capitalized on her growing mystique, starring her in movies with titles such as The Mysterious Lady, during this period, Garbo is reputed to have carried on a romance with the great screen lover, John Gilbert. Gilbert never hid his affection for Garbo, but the Swedish Sphinx denied there was anything between them. Movie star biographer Eve Golden talks about the famous Garbo-Gilbert affair. John Gilbert fell in love with almost every actress he worked with. He, all of his wives were actresses. He fell in love with actresses between times. Sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't. In 1926, he made Flesh and the Devil with Greta Garbo and fell madly head over heels in love with her. There is some discussion as to whether that was returned or not. Uh, they almost got married, but Greta Garbo never showed up for the wedding, and it's really unknown as to how serious she was about her intentions to marry him. Darling person who um, just fell in love too much. But Garbo's popularity would be tested by a cloud looming on the horizon, talkies. Talking pictures were taking over in Hollywood, and foreign-born stars such as Vilma Banke and Emil Jannings found themselves unemployable in Hollywood because of their thick accents. What would be the fate of the divine Garbo? Audiences found out in 1930 
when Garbo released her first talkie, Anna Christie. Garbo Talks was the pitch, as audiences filled theaters to hear as well as see their adored one. Instead of ruining her career, Garbo's accent solidified her image as a woman of mystery. It naturally led to her being cast in the roles of exotic, mysterious foreigners. And who could be more exotic and mysterious than the dancer-turned-spy, Mata Hari? Grand Hotel exemplified the kind of film for which MGM became famous, big, glamorous, and full of stars. Set in post-war Berlin, it tells the story of several disparate characters and their intertwining affairs. I was ambitious, and we were drilled like little soldiers. No rest, no stop. I was little and slim, but hard as a diamond. And I became famous and... But why am I telling you all this? Last night I didn't know you at all. <laughs> I am Felix Benvenuto Freiherr von Geiger. My mother called me Flix. No. Flix. Oh, sweet. And how do you live? And what kind of a person are you? I'm a prodigal son, the black sheep of a white flock. I shall die on the gallows. In addition to Garbo, there was John and Lionel Barrymore, Joan Crawford and Wallace Beery, all of whom feuded bitterly when the cameras weren't rolling. For all of the off-screen rivalry, the on-screen chemistry dazzled, and Grand Hotel won the Oscar for Best Picture. It was in this film that Garbo uttered the line that became tied to her persona, I want to be alone. Queen Christina found Garbo returning to her Swedish roots. She had the title role of the enigmatic monarch who dressed as a man, led a wild life, and ultimately abdicated the throne. I thought you'd understand when you saw me again what had happened. That it had been so enchanting to be a woman. Not a queen, just a woman in a man's arms. She was also reunited with John Gilbert, whose career had gone downhill with the advent of talkies. In 1935, Garbo reprised her role of Anna Karenina, which she had originally played in 1927 opposite Gilbert. You're going away with me. Yes. Yes, Alexei. Don't leave me ever again. Oh. This time, she shared the screen with Frederick March and Basil Rathbone. We're doomed to unimaginable despair. Bliss. Unimaginable bliss. I told you that before you went away. You wanted to to bear that penalty. You will bear it. And I have had to bear mine. Do you hear? Do you hear? Why didn't you tell me? I didn't think you cared what happened to me. 
Anya, dearest, how can you say that? I love you. I love you, Anya. Do you? Don't doubt it. You must never doubt it. I know now that there's no escape for me. I love you, Alexei. I love you. For her performance, Garbo was given the New York Film Critics Award for Best Actress, which she would also win a year later for her next movie, Camille. This film found the divine Garbo in the role of Marguerite Gautier, the elegant courtesan known as Camille, who makes the mistake of falling in love. Appalled by her profession, the young man she is enamored of denounces her. Take this and come back to me when it dies. No, it's impossible. Nothing's impossible now. Send those people in the other room. I can't. Then I will. And how long do you expect this thing to last? Now, you've never known love to last, monsieur. Never? When it was unsanctified by marriage, unblessed by children or social ties. I shall love Armand always. And I believe he shall love me always, too. Always? Always. I could kill you for this. I'm not worth killing, Armand. I've loved you as much as I could love. If that wasn't enough, I'm not to blame. Some of the greatest actresses of stage and cinema had played Camille, but when Garbo took the role, she made it hers forever. For movie fans, Camille is Garbo. No one ever looked so beautiful while dying of tuberculosis. would not be unbecoming on that lovely head. I want no other crown than your loving me. I wish mine were as lasting as yours. In Conquest, made in 1937, Garbo played the Polish Countess Maria, who becomes Napoleon Bonaparte's mistress. What sacrifice for Poland can we make with honor, gentlemen, that we've not already made, that our sons and grandsons have not already made? Are you suggesting that I can succeed while the Polish legions have failed? Perhaps you have been made beautiful, that Poland might be made free. You are a woman. Napoleon is, after all, only a man. You've made me who you? All week. A week of ours that might have been filled with happiness for us both. You are the only woman whose favor I have ever begged for. I love you, Mary. She begs Napoleon, played by Charles Boyer, to free her native land from Russia. I cannot modify my entire policy to suit your feelings. Power has conquered you. I was a fool to expect understanding from a woman. You will see. Russia will see. England will see. Whether I am the slave of power or its master. Goodbye, Mary. You gave greatly for so little. You have given me much more than love, Napoleon Bonaparte. You touched me and gave me life. You lifted me up. The whole world went away from me. I will never know that little world again. Despite the lavish production, Conquest proved as disastrous at the box office as Napoleon's Russian campaign. Cigars, cigarettes, box. Oh, hello, Gailey. I sure I'll buy some of your cigarettes. You got a light, kid? Although adored worldwide, Garbo was also the subject of spoofing, especially in cartoons. <laughs> But Garbo was not above comedy, as she proved in the Ernst Lubitsch classic, Nanotchka. (laughs) 
She plays a stern agent of the Soviet Union sent to Paris, only to be seduced by love and capitalism. It was her first comedy since the slapstick short she made back in Sweden. Her performance earned her a fourth Academy Award nomination for Best Actress. Go to bed, little father. We want to be alone. Please. You like me just a little bit? Your general appearance is not distasteful. Thank you. The whites of your eyes are clear. Your cornea is excellent. Your cornea is terrific. Love isn't so simple, Ninochka. Ninochka, why do doves bill and coo? Why do snails, the coldest of all creatures, circle interminably around each other? Why do moths fly hundreds of miles to find their mates? Why do flowers slowly open their petals? Oh, Ninochka, surely you feel some slight symptom of the divine passion. A general warmth in the palms of your hands. A strange heaviness in your limbs. A burning of the lips. It isn't thirst, but something a thousand times more tantalizing, more exalting than thirst. You're very talkative. Unfortunately, Garbo's next film was the poorly received Two-Faced Woman. Taran, please don't do that. It shocks me. Much of Garbo's appeal was international, and world affairs intruded on her career. The Second World War cut off the lucrative foreign market where Garbo's films made the most money, which may have influenced her next dramatic decision. Although she never explained why, Garbo left the movies. By mutual agreement with MGM, she tore up her contract and went into retirement. For years, studios and movie fans begged her to return to the screen, but to no avail. Here at MGM, we know Garbo is still remembered. Her fan mail has never stopped. Though she hasn't made a picture in a long time, Greta Garbo is still a living, breathing star. Although she had been nominated four times, she never won an Academy Award until she was given an honorary Oscar in 1954. Meanwhile, she went deeper into seclusion. She never married and spent her remaining years in near-complete isolation. It turned out the woman who wanted to be alone really did want to be alone. Garbo died in 1990, as much an enigma as she had ever been. But her movies live on, with the divine Garbo continuing to beguile more generations of moviegoers. Hollywood will always remember Greta Garbo.